Hi, and welcome to Deep End No Floaties, the show that explores major life transitions, whether they're by choice or life just punched you in the face. The goal of this podcast is to learn from others, like the lovely Miss Lark Galley here today, who are going through the same thing and just explore the stories of being human. Sometimes the best medicine is just knowing that we're all in this big mess of a life together. <laughs> so uh, we're always going to start with the most embarrassing stories. I'm your host, Kim Flynn, and today we're going to explore how to prevent and talk about suicide with the lovely Lark Galley, who is so brave to be telling your story, not just here, but a lot of places. She's written a book called Learning to Breathe Again. I just finished reading it a couple of uh, days ago, and so powerful, Lark. So thrilled that you're here. Thank you. Um, we're going to jump in before getting into um, talking about how to prevent and talk about suicide, which is a really heavy topic, obviously. We're gonna kind of mix comedy with tragedy here, and we're gonna start, <laughs> like life does, right? Yes. We're gonna start with your most embarrassing story. So, so when you asked me that, yeah. I immediately thought of when I was working with you. This was about three years ago. Okay. So about a year before my son died, and uh, we were doing some training together. You were having me come in and do some business training and interact with, with the clients that you had and stand up and present my story, and um, I guess, I had this perfectionist facade that I felt I had to portray, you know, like Lark certain does? Like, yes, perfectionist. perfectionist like this. <laughs> and you said to me as I was practicing up there and doing my story, you said, you know, Lark, the people could relate to you better if you would act like you were human. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I still tried, you know, but I, I just had that perception that you had to be perfect yeah. to come across. Yeah. And it came to me after my son died, and I started to talk to people, and the facade was gone. Yes. And it was very real and raw, and I thought, now I know what Kim's talking about, mm. because I could relate to people on a much deeper level, and I didn't have to try to pretend in any way. It was just raw and real. Yeah. So we've known each other for years, right? Yes. And, and like we, like you mentioned, we work together. Um, my experience of you changed so much when you went through this. And I'm, I'm jumping ahead right now. I haven't introduced you yet. But <laughs> my experience of you went from that, which is you're so pulled together and polished and professional and all those P words <laughs> and just like you're a wow right and it looks like a beautiful glossy uh, book cover and um, as soon as your uh, you, I want to say your husband as soon as your your son passed away it was like you just took that off and you were like this is me and you connected in this beautiful heart centered space that was um, as one like perfectionist to another I was like oh my goodness here she is and it's beautiful. Thank you. It's, it's very vulnerable. Yeah. It's not where I necessarily felt comfortable all the time, but it's felt it's what I felt I had to do in order to share this story. Yeah. It's, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to see you change so drastically through this process. You're going to get me all teary already. <laughs> so let me actually introduce you. Um, I have just a few bullet points on you. So you left corporate America to start your own business about 10 years ago. Um, you have a lot of small business experience as an owner. And... Um, big changes uh, when your son took his life about two years ago that altered the direction of your yes. life. And uh, you wrote a book and you speak on a formally and I think still taboo topic, so kudos for speaking out on that, and that is how to prevent and talk about suicide. So tell me, um, uh, let's just jump in. Tell me about I thought a few moments that I thought just stood out so much in the book, and one of them is when you found out. Will you walk us through that story? Yes, that was that was a hard, hard day, and this was on March 21st, 2019. I was doing some teaching, right? And so I was at a building that's not where I normally was, um, and I was I had a class full of, of people there, entrepreneurs that were coming to learn. And about 10 o'clock, I, I kind of looked at my watch. I'd been teaching for about an hour, and a policeman walked in. And I didn't think anything of it because I wasn't normally in that building. I thought, oh, maybe there's a parking issue with an attendee or somebody else in the building. And he asked for me. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever, that's weird. And so he said, could we go back into a, into a private space? And we went to the back room, and there was one chair. And, and he's like, would you please have a seat? And oh, so awkward. He's like standing above you. Yes, he, he was, you know. <laughs> but, but the thing that came across to me was like, oh, he's here to give me some bad news, but he doesn't know mm -hmm. that I can take anything. You know? Oh, wow. I was just, I was just like, 
what, who does he think I am? Like this little wilting flower. Like I don't need to sit down. Yeah, exactly. But I was being polite, right? Wow. Okay. And he said, your, your son is dead. And I, I just went into complete denial. I mean, you hear about these things, right? I, I was like, that's not possible. He can't be dead. I mean, I just saw him yesterday, uh, the morning before when he had left for school. I hadn't seen him the night that the night before because I had gone to bed. He came home late. And I was just like, that, that's just not possible. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, did he die in a car accident on the way to school this morning? And he's like, no, he shot himself. And, and, I, and I was like, what? And all of these things, my, I think I just like shut down and I'm, maybe he expected me to be hysterical. I just like, the emotions immediately turned off. Just gone. Gone. Just like ice queen. I just shut down. And part of it had to do with the way I was raised by a bipolar father and emotionally detached. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately have the ability to turn off my feelings immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, even family members, my spouse. Mm -hmm. If something happens, I can immediately be like, you're dead to me, mm -hmm. which is not good, right? I mean, that's the whole, you can't relate to somebody humanly. I don't know if it's just, if it's not good though, like it, it serves a purpose. It, and maybe yeah. it has to do with my past, like it, that's the way I coped, right? Mm -hmm. Or had dealt with trauma. And then it wasn't until about a week later when I was thinking, why did I act that way? That was so, that was so weird. <laughs> um, and what had happened was, 12 years earlier, my husband had left for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And we had watched this show. Um, we were soldiers with Mel Gibson. It was in Vietnam back in the 1960s. And it talked about how when the soldiers would die, these um, Department of Justice people would come around to the wives and tell them. And my husband was getting ready to go to Afghanistan. I just felt that he was going to die in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And at some point, these these people in suits were going to come and tell me, you know, in these their officer suits, they were going to come and tell me that my husband was going to, was dead, and I was not going to break down like these women. I mean, I had this thing about being a super strong oh, exterior, oh, yeah, and it was embedded in the back of my mind. And so when the officer came to tell me about my son, it's like I flipped to this subconscious scene where I just shut down, hmm. and I thought, this is strange. So it was a week later that you were like, that was really strange of me. Yes. And it took me a week to cry. Wow. I was so angry with my son. Wow. And I um, was talking to a friend of mine whose brother-in-law just took his life this week. And we talked, and she said, Lark, I am so angry with him. Mm -hmm. And I said, I understand. Give him compassion. Give him some grace. He must have been going through some terrible things mm -hmm. for him to come to this point where he had to take his life. It took me a long time to come to that mm -hmm. realization with my son. It feels like as a culture, well, it's a couple things. First of all, my sister passed away about 15 years ago, and I it was shocking as well. And I had the same reaction that you did, Lark. My mom called me on the phone. She said, sit down. And I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm a badass. Yeah. I am on my feet. I don't need, you know, I'm not a weakling like that, you know. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also was raised with pretty emotionless parents that don't believe in emotions. I think there's something there. Um, and then when my mom told me, I just sat there stunned and said, no, but I talked to her yesterday. Like it was like, no, so maybe it's a fairly common exactly. reaction mm -hmm. to just, you know, mm -hmm. be stunned and so. not access emotion right away. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was it seems like uh, in our culture now, we're kind of making a shift from um, the person who uh, takes their life is bad and selfish and evil and they shouldn't do that. We're, we're, we're becoming a lot more compassionate as people and saying, oh my goodness, if that was the solution, they must have been in so much pain. And there's so much more compassion there uh, rather than you committed, like you committed yes. murder, you yes. committed suicide. Like something was really wrong there in order for you to take that final step. And I think that's because more people are, are willing to talk about it, especially people we see as being very beautiful, having the perfect life, mm -hmm. and then the celebrities, or they come out and they tell us how they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps us, quote, everyday people go, okay, well, if somebody's having a perfect life is struggling, then then maybe it is real, and maybe I do have feelings of depression, or, or maybe if I am struggling, 
it's okay to talk to somebody about it. I don't have to pretend. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure all our listeners are wondering what were the signs? Because everyone wants to see the signs, everyone wants to predict something that, you know, they want, how do I not, you know, have this happen in my family or my life? And were there signs? There were in some ways and in some ways not. Okay. So my father was undiagnosed bipolar until he was about 50, which at that point he told us, and, and we're of course all thinking, well, that explains a lot, <laughs> you know? We knew something was wrong. Yes, exactly. We just didn't know what it was. And, and so because of that, I watched my children. And it was something he inherited from his mother. Several of my aunts and uncles had it. My cousins, some of my siblings, you know, mm -hmm. um, had bipolar. And so I always watched my children. And I, I felt fairly confident that none of them um, displayed kind of this, the, the erratic behavior. But in retrospect, there were a couple things that happened. One is that my son was more sensitive than my daughters, which, you know, I used to joke about that, which is not really a joke, right? Mm -hmm. When I look at that now, he was more sensitive maybe to what people said to him, or he was more sensitive to other people's circumstances. He would go and support his friends. He would go to, you know, the, the pro-gay rallies because one of his friends was, was gay, or he would do different things that would always support his friends, always support the underdog. Mm -hmm. And he was just more sensitive to people that might be hurting. In your, in your research or experience talking about suicide um, after this has happened, do you see that's a trend? Yes, yes, it is, yes. really. So I went to um, um, a bereaved mother's um, get together, mm -hmm. and all of the mothers there whose teenage children had died by suicide, they all said, my child was extra compassionate. Wow. And I think that they just feel so much, they feel their own feelings, and then they take on other people's feelings, it's hard for them to sort of balance things out and it gets too heavy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So instead of maybe making fun of these people that are sensitive and compassionate, maybe a little bit more, um, help them deal with their feelings a bit better. That's what I would do. Yeah. So he's more sensitive, but really besides that, not much, not many red no, flags. No, when he was 16, or to me 15, almost 16, he was starting his sophomore year um, my husband and he were having a talk, you know, a Sunday evening out on the front porch. It's one of these parent talks mm -hmm. where you're trying to push and motivate your child. But at what point do you push too much? Mm -hmm. And my husband's like, you're starting your sophomore year. You know, if you want to get into college and do these things in mechanical engineering, then you need to like buck up, get good grades. You need to do this and this and this and this, right? Mm -hmm. One of those talks. And because of my husband's military training, he noticed that my son disengaged. Mm. His eyes disengaged with him. And my husband had the... He kind of went somewhere. Yes, exactly. Okay. And my husband had the foresight to ask him, which is very unusual. This mm -hmm. is so strange. He said, are you feeling suicidal? Wow, just out of the blue. Yes, because he, so he yeah. saw my son disengage. And, and I don't think I would have said that. I would have been like, hey, hello, wake up. I'm talking <laughs> to you. Yes, yeah. And my son said, yes, I am. Wow. So a couple things there. Number one, that he asked him, are you feeling suicidal? That's important. It's not, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Because mm -hmm. when people are at that point, they're not thinking of hurting themselves. They're thinking, I'm already in pain. I'm going to stop this pain. So just ask the question. Yes. Ask yes. the question. Yes. And ask your kids this, you know. And the fact that my son said yes, that was, that was a big step on his part. And so um, my husband came in from outside and said, Christian's feel suicidal, would you please stay with him? I'm going to call the military suicide hotline and get him some some help. So we got him to a therapist the next day, and over the course of a, a few months, it came out that he he told me, Mom, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. And, and he had to say that in front of the therapist, which I think made him more comfortable to say that. And I, I think he expected me to get very angry about mm -hmm. that, because you know we, we go to church every week, and we believe in God. And I just looked at him and like, okay, mm -hmm. um, I believe God is science, but I can't make you believe in God. Mm -hmm. And I think he was surprised that I sort of took that approach and didn't say, you will believe, you know. You must. Yes, exactly. And I think that took a big burden off him, being able to have that open conversation with me. Mm -hmm. He never said that to his dad, mm -hmm. right? He said it to me, and I, of course, said it to his dad, but he didn't want to have that conversation with his dad for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, we went to the therapist for a couple of months and kind of worked things out with, okay, if you're feeling suicidal, what can you do? 
and then he said, Mom, I'm good. I don't need to go back anymore. And this was what, two years no, before? This was about um, two and a half, no, three and a half, three years before. Three. And there was nothing else in that time? No, no. And my biggest regret is like, why didn't I think to say, hey, how are you doing? Any more suicidal thoughts? You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, if I tell you something, then that's, I'm, I'm very at face value, right? Mm -hmm. And I just assumed that if he was struggling, that he would say something. And that, that wasn't the case. He didn't say anything. Do you think you avoided the topic um, because you didn't want to embarrass him or he didn't want to bring up I, old trauma? No, or? I just didn't even think just about it. Yeah. I didn't even consider it. And my father had died by suicide uh, five years before my son did. Mm -hmm. and I talked a lot about his death and how traumatic it had been for me and, and all of these things that I had to go through after he died as the executor and just how traumatic it was. Mm -hmm. With the thought that if I instill in my children how traumatic it was, they would never do this. Hmm. And apparently that wasn't the case. But what I didn't realize is that when someone in your family dies by suicide, that increases the chance of someone else in your family, increases their chance of suicide by 50%. Wow. Didn't know that. Hmm. Is that because of genetics, or just because it's an acceptable? It's, it's now an option. It's an option. That's They've kind of seen like, it as an yes. option. Okay. It's kind of like in high schools how you see um, kids, yeah. the copycat suicide. Mm -hmm. Well, so and so did it. That must be a way out. You know, they ended all their problems. Mm -hmm. That's now an option. Mm -hmm. And that was a big catalyst for me in getting into this suicide prevention because that's not my first thought when my son died. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hide, I didn't want to talk about it, I didn't want to go out in society. And then my friends started reaching out and telling me how their children were struggling. And I thought, if I don't speak out and these kids take their lives, then that's on me. Mm -hmm. If I speak up, you know, and they still choose to take their lives, I can't do anything about that, but who can I control? I can control what I say and do. And that was the big catalyst, is that parents wake up, you know, it's happening. It could happen in your home. Wow. Um, so several things in the book that I wanted to talk about. Thanks for sharing your story, by the way. Um, really powerful and, and really painful. You speak about it so eloquently, but I mean, that is, that is every parent's worst yes. nightmare. And here you are just bravely talking about it. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Like, Congratulations or kudos or wow. It's, it was, it's I'm very raw in the book. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is that um, I want people to know I have lots of regrets. Um, my relationship with my son wasn't this beautiful relationship. It was a struggle. He was a hard kid for me. Mm -hmm. And there are things I put in there that I would, I want parents to know what I wish I had known mm -hmm. before my son died. How would I have changed my relationship with my child? How do I parent now? Do you think you, you do you think you could have like if you had the foresight what, what would you have done differently like you were you and you knew what you knew then and he was him and he knew what he like how do you, you know, how do you learn the lessons before you learn them you know right exactly yeah. it's just like yeah. we were just so you know bullheaded both of us we yeah. wanted things our way and I think in retrospect maybe I could have lightened up on him mm -hmm. once again I was we we're a military family you know you run the that mm -hmm. tight ship right mm -hmm. and maybe I could have talked a little bit more, spent more time on his interests, and not have pushed him maybe so hard. Being a sensitive kid. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Is that what you mean by, um, you said we can't parent like we used to parent. Tell me about that. Right. So think about the most embarrassing thing that happened to you in high school. Mm, there were many. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe what, 10 people knew? Probably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, what happens to our kids now in school, junior high, high school, if something embarrassing happens to them? How many people do you think know about it? Yeah, it gets texted. Texted. Social media. Exactly. A yeah. hundred people, a thousand people, all over, right? Mm -hmm. And suddenly, as a teenager, they're thinking, my life is over. Mm -hmm. And how embarrassing and crushing that is. I, I know for me, my embarrassing moment at, at high school, you know, there were maybe, maybe five people knew about it. I felt like I couldn't even go back to school mm -hmm. the next day. That's how embarrassing it was. In retrospect, I look back and I'm like, oh, it happens, right? But when you're in it, you that's your world, mm -hmm. and you can't see past that. So as parents, we need to um, help instill in our children the idea that they have worth, 
no matter what happens outside themselves. Mm -hmm. um, okay, they get a terrible grade on a test. Let's talk about it. What could we have done differently? You know, do you need some extra tutoring in that? Not the end of the world. Not if somebody, a kid comes home with a, you know, failing grade, parents, I promise you, that is not the end of the world. There are other things that are the end of the world. So helping them <clears throat> just keep the little things in perspective yes, more. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's kind of what you wish you'd done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there were some moments uh, that I wanted to talk about that I thought were really powerful in your book. One of the moments was um, when uh, all of your grown kids gathered in his room, on his bed, and just kind of breathed in the air of, of what had just happened. Mm -hmm. Talk to me more about that, I was interested. So we all went to bed that night, that the first day that he had died, mm -hmm. and uh, it was hard to sleep, but we were all trying, and, and eventually we all got up at different times. Like in the middle of the night? Yes, you know, we couldn't sleep, none of us could sleep. And my oldest daughter, who, who has her own place, she came home and was staying with us for a few days, just because we wanted to cocoon, we mm -hmm. just wanted to be together. And um, I went up to my son's room, and um, his bed was actually gone because they had taken it away. Mm -hmm. And uh, my daughter was there. She actually slept on the floor in his room for a couple nights. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband was there in the room, mm -hmm. and, and then I ended up there as well. And the three of us just sat with our backs against the wall, and we, we just kind of silently grieved together mm -hmm. in this room, thinking it could have been different. That's a moment. Mm -hmm. When my sister passed, we did the same thing. Uh, all the grown kids flew in from across the country, and we sat in the dining room table, and we read her journals out loud. Oh, that's that's a hard thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's a moment. Um, it seems like in in times of like terrible tragedy, there is one moment that just stands out in your head, and it's the most traumatic moment or the most poignant moment or some kind of moment, and that's the moment it feels like just beats you up again and again. You were talking about in the book, and I won't go into detail with it, but you had a moment with your dad's passing that just yes. killed you, yes. you know? How do you get through those really hairy things that just stick in your brain? So I think I know the one you're talking mm -hmm. about when I had been so stoic dealing with all my father's issues and, you know, his estate and being strong for the other kids and all of that, and then having to deal with something that was really hard, mm -hmm. and just breaking down and being so angry with him. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to acknowledge our different emotions, mm -hmm. acknowledge what we're going through, not try to hide, okay, this is anger, and say, oh, I shouldn't be angry, but I am angry, right? Mm -hmm. Get it out, deal with it, and then um, realize that they didn't do it out of spite. Mm -hmm. They're not doing things to, to try to make my life harder and worse. There are a lot of times people who take their lives are doing it because they feel like they're a burden to their family. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, if I go away, my family will, will be so much happier. Mm -hmm. and, and try to see things with compassion. I, I have a lot more compassion for people. I felt so badly for your husband uh, because your son took his life after having a hard conversation with your husband. Yes. How do you forgive yourself? How do you, like, because, you know, I have arguments with my kids, mm -hmm. not on a regular basis, but when we have it an happens. argument, and then if they were to, mm -hmm. you know, pass away the next minute or day, that is traumatic. How, do you, how, do, you, how do you forgive yourself? How do you move on from that? So I think a couple of things is we can't blame. We have to get over the blame, and whether that blame is I'm blaming the person who took their life, or I'm blaming myself, or I'm blaming another family member, a lot of times we want to assign blame. Mm -hmm. And early on I realized that that would just tear our family up. Mm -hmm. Even even not blaming him. Yes, even not blaming him. That is That was hard, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, if he hadn't done this, then this and this and this wouldn't have happened. So I know it's, it's easy to say, like, oh, I just don't blame people. How do you actually do it? Like, in the yes. moment when you're feeling blamed, do you stop yourself? Yes. Do you, like, what do you do? Yes. What's the action plan? <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you have to control your thoughts. Okay. Because um, you have a saying, uh, easy now, hard later, mm. hard now, easy later, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to do with myself. So the first thing that I had to do was confront reality. And it is really hard to confront reality, whatever we're going through, whatever difficult thing. 
um, I, a lot of times in the beginning I would say, well, if he hadn't died, mm -hmm. and I would have to tell myself, stop. You do not live in a universe where he can come walking through the door or where you can change it and make it go back. But if he did, no, stop. Mm -hmm. And I had to be really mentally strong mm -hmm. to make sure I stop that whole fantasy. Because so no fantasizing. No fan. It is it's, it's my real. husband has died. Or sorry, my, yeah. my, my son has yes. died. My son has died. Yes. My son has died. Yes. Son has died. Okay. yes. Okay. And that and and guess what? I have to deal with that. That is that is reality. And so many of us don't want to face reality. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of how I shocked my system. Like, no, you will get through this. And it was several weeks of, but but. You know, but if, if I'd done yes, this, or yeah, if I'd done yes. that, okay. And, and no, that is not reality. Okay. And so catching myself there. And then also, well, if my husband hadn't had that conversation. There's the blame. Yes. Okay. But he did. And I can't change that. Yeah. But if he had, nope, he did. Okay. That's it. And there was nothing really that he said that was out of line, right? It's just a parental conversation where you're trying to say, Hey son, I love you. Shape you, up. Shape up. Yeah, you're, yeah. You, these are a couple things that I see in your life where you're strained. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I did say to him, my husband, was like, you know, 11 o'clock at night when everybody's tired, it's not the time to have one of these come to Jesus moments, right? With did, your you, kid. did you regret having that conversation with your husband? Because that is saying like, hey, you, you screwed up, you know? Not really, because when I when I came home after the policeman saw me and he came up to me and he was sobbing and he put, their, put his arms around me and said, it's my fault. It's my fault that he died. I shouldn't have had that conversation. And I, he had told me earlier that morning that he had had a conversation, you know, and the things he said, I was like, oh. I probably would have had that conversation too, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I said, you know, honey, it's not your fault. We don't know what Krishna was going through. Maybe he would have killed himself in a month mm -hmm. or in a year. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. I said, and there was nothing wrong with what you said. I said. But I did come out and I said, but you know what? Maybe next time let's not do it mm -hmm. at night when everybody's tired. Because I have other kids, right? And and I I, I don't want him to, to like, repeat that. Mm -hmm. And so, even though I felt like, hey, maybe we could do something differently, I was trying not to blame, and I was trying to explain to him that it could have happened to anybody. It could have happened to any parent, and I could have done it too. And it, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't, it, it wasn't just one thing, right? When, when a team loses a game, yeah. it's not just one person who makes the mistake. That It was the, the whole team, and I'm like, we're a team, and we could have done something better. Um. Oh, I know what I want to talk about. So, I thought you handled this topic really carefully in your book and really bravely. And that is, when a family is going through trauma, or when a person is going through trauma, your relationships are all going to be affected, right? And so, you just touched on it enough to be respectful of your husband, which I appreciated in your relationship there. But you also said, this has had major repercussions. This has had major influence and impact. I was just talking to a friend yesterday who said, you know, my husband's going through this work thing, and because of that, he and I are now on the, you know, on, on, on rocky ground. And so thanks for bringing that up. Do you want to talk more about that? Sure. So um, marriage is hard, mm -hmm. as we all know, right? And yes. relationship is hard, all of that. Um, I had heard a statistic that Couples who lose a child, however, suicide, SIDS, whatever, a car accident, their increased likelihood of divorce is 30%. Wow. That's so from 50% yeah, to yeah, like 80%? Yes, yeah, exactly. That's Holy significant. Yeah. Right? And uh, I had heard that before, and I'm like, how, how much harder can it be?